Research tells us that we're spending more time, energy, and money on self-care than ever before. And yet, rates of burnout are increasing. Maybe it's time we rethink the strategy. Radical. Fundamentally changing the nature of something, making change political. While we think of self-care, we might think about this like bubble baths, scented candles, weighted blankets. Radical self-care is not your everyday self-care. It is about fundamentally changing the way we take care of ourselves. It is about making our existence and our community's existence political. As a psychologist, I have taught many people about self-care. And like many of us, I have historically been awful at putting it into practice. It was always something other people needed. But when it came to myself, it just never felt that important. There were too many things to do. And for the most part, I was fine. Until I wasn't. Rewind to about three years ago, and I had just given birth to my son. Now, for context, I had a business that was about one year old, and I remember when I was pregnant thinking to myself, while being a mom is definitely going to be a priority for me, so are my professional goals. And I wasn't going to let being a mom get in the way of those professional goals. And so I decided I had the capacity to do everything. I continued to see my clients, continued to grow the business, continued to try to be the best mom I could. People would often tell me to slow down, to sleep when baby sleeps, to say no more. But I couldn't. There was too much to do, and rest and self-care, they were not going to make it on the list. But it wasn't just about workload. It was about being a passionate person who cares about so many things that caring for myself, well, it's just a little lower than it needed to be on that list for me to do anything about it. And so I pushed. And in some ways, I was doing it. My business was growing. I was seeing my clients. I was reaching many of my professional goals. And I was mostly being the kind of mom I thought I wanted to be. I had convinced myself that I could do everything until I got sick. While I had managed to convince myself that I could do everything, I had also convinced myself that I had pretty much no needs. Good sleep, didn't need it. Physical activity, didn't need it. Nutritious food, didn't need it. Rest, breaks, fun, didn't need it. It was almost as though everyone and everything was more deserving of my attention. Raise your hand if you're someone who tends to put the needs of almost everyone else above your own. Yeah. Clearly, I'm in good company. But the reality is that it was unsustainable for me, and it forced me to take a really close look at what was going on. I realized that while self-care conceptually made sense to me, it didn't resonate with me because it felt self-indulgent. And while there's nothing wrong with taking care of ourselves through self-indulgence, it just didn't feel right for me. This is where radical self-care comes in. Radical self-care is about engaging in constant self-care. This means that every choice that we make, every move that we make, will be an act of self-care. It's also about recognizing that we are part of community. And so community care has to be a necessary component for how we engage in self-care. Raise your hand if you're someone who is told that you're doing too much for others and you need to prioritize yourself. Now, keep your hand up if that advice just didn't resonate with what was right for you. For many of us, 
caring for others, contributing to others, that's how we engage in self-care. It makes us feel good. And the idea of stopping, well, it just doesn't feel right. It would feel like the opposite of self-care. So then how can we continue to give to others the way we feel we need to while also taking care of ourselves? Well, in the late 1960s, during the civil rights movement, there was an understanding that access to care, and really access to human rights in general, was inequitable. And so Black and Latinx folks had to gather for community advocacy, community survival. Folks understood that they needed to take care of each other in order for them to survive and in order to foster well-being, because the reality is that no one else was looking after it. But part of that community advocacy was also self-preservation. And this is where the concept of radical self-care comes from. Folks realized that for communities to survive, which meant for them to survive, they had to show up in community. But in order to show up in community, folks also had to take care of themselves. Because if they weren't taking care of themselves, they couldn't show up and do the work. In Audre Lorde's book, A Burst of Light, she writes, I am saving my life by using my life in the service of what must be done. I am saving my life by using my life in the service of what must be done. Audre Lorde was dying, and she spent her last weeks and months of her life continuing to do the work that she knew was important for her community's survival because that was part of her survival. She surrounded herself with as much love and as much sweetness as she possibly could, but it was love and sweetness and the work, not one, not the other. When we realize that self-care is something that we engage in constantly, it stops being something that we carve out time for. It's something that we do all of the time. When we realize that we are part of community, community care stops being something outside of ourselves. It becomes part of how we take care of ourselves. So now you might be wondering, if radical self-care is about continuing to give to others, haven't we been doing this the whole time? Why are we still so burnt out? Yeah, you're right. Radical self-care is about continuing to give, but it's also about being intentional about how we give to ourselves and to others. Radical self-care has three main components. The first is connecting with what is important to us. These might be our values, our passions, our intentions. If any of you are like me, you may have a vague understanding of what your values are, but you might be less attuned to what drives you. This sometimes happens when we're so busy saying yes to things that we lose sight of why we're doing what we're doing or even what's important to us. Anyone been there before? In order to connect or reconnect with our values, we need to intentionally think about what these are. So let's take a moment and try. I invite you to close your eyes if you feel comfortable doing so. And think about the last time that you felt totally and completely connected with yourself and the world around you. What were you doing? Who was there? Where were you and what were you surrounded by? How did you feel? When we take the time to really think about what our values are, this will help us answer the question, when do I feel most alive and satisfied? And our answers, they'll all vary. For example, for me, I know that I feel most connected when I'm free, when I'm getting to be creative, and when I'm contributing. Once we know what our values are, we can use them as a compass to guide every single one of our decisions. And we know that when we're doing that, we're also going to be feeling alive and satisfied. We will know that even when the situations are hard, when we are living by our values and letting them guide our decisions, 
that we're contributing to a good life, a life that's gonna help us and our communities flourish. The second step of radical self-care is having flexibility and practicing self-compassion. When we are living by our values, sometimes the way that that will look will vary. For example, sometimes my value of contribution will mean that I'm spending my time and my energy helping someone who needs it. At other times, it will mean that I'm spending my time and energy working on something that helps me grow and learn. The value of contribution is the same, but how I will practice it will be context specific. We wanna to try to be so attuned to our values that we can recognize the different ways that it will show up and the different contexts under which it will show up. When we do this, even when the situation is its toughest, even when we wish we weren't in that situation, we will know that we are living by our values. Self-compassion also comes in handy. Self-compassion is about treating ourselves with the same kindness, respect, patience, and compassion with which we treat others. We all make mistakes. I make them all the time. I know you make them too. Instead of responding to ourselves with shame and criticism, something many of us are all too familiar with, Maybe we can acknowledge that we did the best we could with the information that we had available to us. Maybe we can acknowledge that the outcome was unfortunate and we can try to learn from it. We can try to acknowledge the feelings that come with the disappointing mistake. Maybe it's fear, maybe it's sadness. Maybe we can allow ourselves to experience that feeling. Maybe we can even offer ourselves some support through those feelings. If the concept of self-compassion is unfamiliar to you, that's okay. Maybe you can offer yourself some grace and some patience as you figure out how, if at all, it can apply in your life. And if you notice yourself feeling a little resistant to the idea of self-compassion, that's okay too. I know I was when I was first learning about it. Maybe you can be curious about where this judgment comes from and figure out what you want to do with it. The last step of radical self-care is to focus on our strengths. These are the things that we're good at, partly because we're skilled and partly because we're passionate about it. When we spend our time doing things that we can be effective, we feel effective. We no longer end up working in ways that make us feel drained or dissatisfied because that is a recipe for burnout. Now, we might think we're working in ways that are uh, working towards the things that are important to us, and so we may wonder why we're feeling so defeated and depleted. It's possible that while we're, while we're working towards things that are important to us, we're not working in ways that honor our strengths. We want to think about our strengths as gifts, things that we are uniquely capable of doing both because of our skills and because of our passion. When we think about it this way, we will be saving our capacity for working on the things that are meant for us. When we're able to do this, then we're also going to be living in ways that honor our values. We will no longer end up working in ways that make us feel defeated or, defeated or depleted. And yes, this does mean that we're going to be saying no more. But now we're not going to be saying no because we're burnt out or because we don't have capacity. We're going to be saying no because we know that this is not the best way for us to use our strengths. And this means that we are going to be saving our capacity and saving our energy for the things that we know we are most uniquely capable of contributing. And this will allow us to say yes more and to the things that count. When we live and embody radical self-care, we will be engaging in constant self-care. We won't need breaks from life. 
Every choice that we make will be meaningful and satisfying, and we will restore joy and fulfillment in our lives. We will be living and breathing self-care in everything that we do. We will be living to live. Thank you.